Hi man, Drew Armstrong and welcome to the back office teardown lab. Look at this. These are two Nintendo Famicoms, of course the Japanese version of the Nintendo Entertainment System that we enjoyed in the 80s and beyond. Um, and I picked these up on eBay. They're not particularly cheap anymore, actually. They're not particularly cheap, especially considering you can't really run them anymore off a, a regular telly. And that's because they have RF output. And RF output was very common back in the day, but that was when we could receive signals through the TV antenna and less so now, um, and because we're obviously on digital. But also these have that additional uh, annoyance that they're NTSC J, that's the Japanese version of NTSC. So I'm just looking over these just to see if there's any superficial damage. There is, and that's not something that's completely unsolvable. We might be able to kind of semi-restore one of these. And that's, you have a smashed eject button here, and that's something that we could just salvage from a donor unit or 3D print. I do have a relatively nice red colour filament in PLA that can, can print that with. And on this one the button is actually intact, or I say the, the slider bar rather. But it does have a little chip of plastic in the door, which that's a bit sad, hard to do. Now let's have a look at the controllers. Yeah, I mean they're probably working, but yeah, just not very pretty. Not so much you can do to restore that unless you're going to make a new silk screen. This one's in not too bad a condition, but there's a dent. So, you know, like most things of this age, you're going to get a few knocks and bruises. But I like to get these working so I can use them. So I think we're going to start on this paler one right now. And the reason they uh, have different colours, that's because there was a flame retardant added to the plastic that would cause the plastic to yellow. And I don't think it's even the plastic that's yellowing, it's actually the flame retardant in the plastic. And unfortunately you get that yellowing effect. And it is possible by applying various chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide and the sun, the bleaching power of the sun to temporarily, or I say, I say temporarily, it might give you, <laughs> could give you years, it could give you decades, probably longer than you'll be alive, um, a restoration of that, but possibly at the uh, expense of damaging the plastic. Again, it depends what you're going for. If you are looking to restore one of these and you'd like it nice and pale and looking fresh, I suggest you just pay that little bit of extra money and get one that looks like that from the... Uh, from the vendor. Now there are various models of Nintendo Famicom and you'll see that when you pop the lid. They're denoted by a couple of different flavours of motherboard revision but essentially there's two ways of identifying it. We'll have a look here. The first way of course it's going to be written everything but this is the best one so if you if you have one of these you're in luck because this is the easiest one to restore in fact it's learning a bit of dust in here I've seen this before this kind of brownish kind of fluff I don't know if it's a common thing maybe it was from smoking back in the day but what I will do is I will pop the lid on the other one so we can just do a side-by-side -side comparison and I have noticed on this that the screws are pretty appear to have been semi removed so that means somebody might have already been here and tried to repair it that could be a worry now that's something as well you have to be aware of if you are purchasing one of these be aware and beware of modded ones so that's where people have attempted to modify them to get them to work with a relatively modern composite output I say relatively modern because composite's been around for like 80 years or something, but they've been modified to run on those modern tellies and they can have been messed up. These are pretty fragile. So the, the main boards on these are relatively fragile, but the most fragile component, unfortunately, are the Rico CPU and, and PPUs. Now, this is fantastic though, because I get to show you both kinds. So this one on the left, you'll see that the modulator and power supply board is totally separate. And if you look back on my previous videos, you'll see I've worked on these before, and even the Famiclone actually came in and it had the same arrangement. So that was that's the best you can get because it's gonna make your life easier. 
This one, it's not as good, but you can still do the same thing, but it's just a bit of a pain because you'll see they're very heavy mounts here, and that's mounting this whole modulator can on here. I suspect what happened was there was a problem with emissions, and in fact, some of the family clones you used to get in the 90s used to have a little antenna that you could put on the back, and it would actually beam its picture to your telly antenna input. So that shows how much RF uh, radiation was probably coming out of these, and I suspect that was put in there to mitigate them. But not to worry, I think I'm going to I'm going to change my tact now. I think we're going to do both of these at the same time. So what you've got to do is simply remove the modulator boards. And that's with that caveat previously mentioned about the one on the right. But the one on the left is great because all you really need to do on this one is just undo these four screws. One, two, three, four. And then depending on what you've got, you've got you've got two options here. If you've got a solder sucker, you can suck each of the connections. And I'll just move this one out of the way while we work on this. And I'm going to show you those connections right there. So you'll see there's seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exactly seven pins that you need to desolder. Now, if you don't have a solder sucker, it is possible to very gently apply pressure to the ribbon. So you can lift this up and out pull the ribbon down while just touching that with the soldering iron tip and you want a relatively small soldering iron, you don't want to go nuts, in fact I'm just going to do it now, and you, you can actually just pull the ribbon through and I can feel it there actually sliding through. Again, not, not too great, don't hold on to too long, you'll melt the insulation on the ribbon. Or you can do the similar thing where you just get your solder sucker though and heat the point, put the solder sucker over, hit suck and then you'll clear up the joint like that and it will still be sticking there a little bit but with a little bit of force it will just pull it through. So I'm just going to work my way through those. Now I've got no idea on the condition of these. I, I picked them up and it just said like, you know, untested. <laughs> the, usual, the usual untested junk, whatever they want to classify them which normally means they have an issue or just means they haven't tested them because of course this power supply on the Famicom is a center negative which means the chances of plugging something wrong in and blowing these up is relatively high and you can see there's a lot of dust and gunk in there but nothing scorched so hopefully they haven't nuked this one so I'm just going to continue now and remove this Almost there. Oh, and you can see, if you didn't have the solder sucker, you still wouldn't have the problem. See, that's out now. So there are two more wires to remove, though. It is connected here. You see there's a white and red wire that's underneath. That is the power switch. So let's disconnect the power switch as well while we're here. I think that's the power switch one. wrong one that's why it wasn't coming there we go so you've got that out now you can just sling that in your pile of modulators I don't know what I do in mine they, I, I sling them somewhere and they seem to just disappear after a while and then take whatever you have snip wise uh, oh god it's all it's all crazy right side cutters are good too and just have a look at those connectors and just see that there's one that's not quite nice I'm gonna trim that nicely so now you've got them all even Stevens so what you're going to do is install your modern replacement, which is a power vamp. So this has got all of the circuitry required to not only give you that nice clean composite output for your modern telly, but it actually has a power supply on here that re totally replaces the original power supply. So this will run cool, have plenty more current to drive the systems on board. And more importantly, on PowerVamp V4, you've got a multicolor LED. Now that does sound, I know it doesn't sound that exciting, but boy, it is exciting because it not only shines through the case and does a nice RGB effect, but apparently someone is soon to release an, a clear shell top case. And if you Google it, clear t shell top case, you can see that on the internet. And it's going to look absolutely fantastic with that. So you can see now, just cleaning up those pins. Just give them a little touch up, make sure they're nice and clean. Because I want to focus on getting this aligned 
and because you've got to poke through seven of them you want to make sure that the spacing's quite right just take your time on that part I don't advise you soldering them in one at a time I advise you push them all through look exactly like that now I'm going to zoom in so you get to see they've all poked through and they're all sitting oh <laughs> they were all sitting nice and flush to the edge of that ribbon it should go in again yeah you can see there now it's nice and flush so just leave it there make sure to, and just back away slowly I'm backing away slowly <laughs> so it's just it's hovering there but that's fine and it'll give you enough time to just get your soldering iron ready yeah so you can just go in there and just give them a little dash of solder again don't go brutal on it it doesn't need to take a lot of time if everything's nice and clean you'll see it just flows just like that and that's done that was no effort at all so if you're putting a lot of effort into it back up because you're probably going a little bit wrong you're, you're dwelling you're putting too much heat on there something is going wrong at that point so we can actually install the board now screw in because we don't need to go any further with that we, we can solder this other wire outside and what you'll notice there are locating pins here which make sure that this locates absolutely positively and then you're just going to put in your original four screws back again and that'll keep everything nicely held while we work on that power switch and there are various power switch options actually on on some of these so I'm going to show you when we do the other flavor of Famicom how that one goes because effectively we there's two ways we jumper the board or you can relocate it totally it's up to you what you want to do I always go with the jumpering option because that's how I roll but there are other people actually in the community already uh, are modifying them in different ways so they actually are tweaking their systems with their power vamps even so one uh, mod that I heard that now mo most of the problems that you will have with jail bars and no noisy pictures and things like that that you see as a common complaint on these will be eliminated once you install this and install a nice modern PSU. When I say modern PSU it doesn't have to be expensive. We're talking you know an eight pound, seven pound AC adapter off Amazon. Just modern, it, you know, because they're much cleaner. And um, But some people have particular issues with the jail bars and whatnot because there are issues within the chips themselves, these Ricoh chips. So one of the mods they do actually, someone added onto the output, I'm not quite sure where, I'll have to have a look. They actually added a ferrite <laughs> so remember those ferrite beads an inductor and the inductor actually removed that so that's pretty cool if that's the case right have a look now this corner that's where the power switch goes and I'm just going to top solder it so it's up to you if you want to you can poke the, the through hole components through exactly as you'd normally do or you can just do what I do and I just solder it from the top because there is room within the case just bend the leads over you can see that they're just nicely folded over that way I run them parallel just like that and I just apply a tiny bit of heat just for a second boom and they're in right no more than that don't dwell you don't need to they don't need a lot of heat and the second one done just check they're not touching or anything like that otherwise it'll be on permanently <laughs> <laughs> and you're done and if you have faith in your work I mean if you're not going to go any further either you know you're not going to want to do the retro brighting or repair the plastics you can stop right there but there is something that I would advise you to do before you go any further and that is install the little plastic clip that comes with the power vamp and that's basically a port cover now depending on when you, when you want to install it it's probably better by the way to install it before you screw the board in I've made a bit of a boo-boo but be a bit careful here because the plastics are quite soft in talking about the plastics of the Famicom you want to make sure you don't damage it too much you can see here there is a fragile bit there you see it's actually when we focus it's actually just starting to bend you know so it's mm, just be careful you don't want to force this these old plastics I'm just going to open this one out. Come on. And if you get when you get your port cover, just test fit it on the board before you put it in in case you need to adjust it as a 3D printed part. So you just want to make sure that it's nice and clean in there. And it's purposefully left a little bit airing on the side of having too much material and too less material. Otherwise it would be a loose fit, but just whatever you've got, you can just put in a little scraper or a knife. And if you can see that, this is how much plastics come off that. 
just the tiniest amount. You don't need to go nuts, just the tiniest amount. Just enough so it bites nicely. So you can see it's clipped on there. It did lose that little tiny bit of plastic in there. So I say, fragile, just be super careful when you do your one. Don't rush it like me. And then that's the perfect finishing touch though. Once you get everything aligned. Just gonna make sure, oh, I haven't made a misalignment. Make sure that there's also no cables caught. There we go. That's better. And it will look something like that when it's screwed shut. And when it's all screwed together, it will seal up those seams nicely and you get a nice cover on the back. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely perfect. So that one is done and we're going to try that at the end and we're going to try it with an actual game cartridge. Now one thing before I put it aside and start on the other one, is make sure this volume is down. There's a lot of people complain initially. <laughs> I see it in the Discord and they say, there's a lot of noise, it's going Aah. I think there's something wrong. Yeah, that volume. It's a microphone and basically it records the sound and puts it straight out into the audio. So if you've got that, and especially if it's up full, it'll, it's not the volume, it's, well, it's kind of like the microphone recording volume, not an output volume, so you will hear that. And I think that's pretty good to go. And I obviously can source one of these eject buttons, but yeah, the eject is working. We'll leave that in there. That's a copy of Hydlide. We'll try it with Hydlide. And then let's look at this other option here. That's the second board. And you can see less screws in some respects, but you have to undo other parts here. So we're going to continue here on the top. Let's get that out. Now fortunately all of the screws are pretty much the same. I've not I don't recall I've ever found a different screw. If you find a different screw, then there's probably someone's been in there. But the case screws and the PCB screws are the same, so you can't really mix those up. I'm gonna take these front two here. And there, by the way, is the power wire. So you remember what I said about the power wire? It's up to you if you want to relocate it. I'll give you both options in this video. Okay. So there, now that can come out. And what I would advise, look at that, the dirt on it. <laughs> it's a bit fluffy. What I would advise is probably to remove these joystick ports just so they don't get in the way. The power you can leave for now. And I'll describe the power mod while I'm here. So on the power vamp unit itself, I've mentioned that this power switch, generally I just advise people jump at that and leave it as is. I mean, then that works absolutely fine. You might find with the RGB variant that the RGB light will stay on. Normally um, it's not an issue because it's not much draw, especially for the variants which don't have the RGB light or the V3s, the quiescent current is so low it's not really using any power, but the light would still technically come on. But if you don't want that, you'd have to rewire this power switch here, which you can just see which contact it is on this power switch, just put a longer piece of wire, route it round this side up to that power switch, and then where it was connected to the main board here, you just add a wire jumper between the two. So you're moving the responsibility of the power switching to here and that should work absolutely fine for you. In this case, I'm not gonna do that because I, I like to keep it simple for people. So we're just gonna flip this over. We've got the board here now. And this is where it becomes quite challenging because you do have these awfully chunky terminals and they're gonna need a lot of heat to remove them and in fact, a lot of people don't have soldering irons really capable of them and I'm using a TS100 and it's a really old tip, it's not doing too great but we're going to try with this. Um, I would advise if you've got it to use flux, I do happen to have some here so I might as well practice what I preach and put some on there. Big old dollop, you're going to need a lot of flux and a lot of heat. So set your iron as hot as it can go. Oops, we'll throw it around. I'm going to go for 450. That's pretty, pretty toasty. Just because I know that this tip won't hold that heat for very long once it starts touching this because the heat sink will start doing what it's supposed to do and that's sinking heat. Oh, you can see that there. You see it touched it there? Bang! Get in there and start sucking. And you're going to need several goes to even dent this. 
In fact, I think my solder sucker's actually blocked. It's so much solder. So I would advise you not even to start this unless you've got a reasonably good solder sucker because I can't see how you're going to do it other than, you know, starting to cut the metal of the heatsink. I mean, you'd have to dremel... If you could dremel the heatsink off, you probably have a chance. There we go. That one is a good one. So that last one, you see it really got the last bit out. And just watch where those balls of solder go. It's, I mean, these are massive amounts of solder. I think all Nintendo's soldering budget went there. And you could... I don't know if you just saw that. As I, as I emptied the solder sucker, it actually splooged it onto the main board here. So again, I'm going to have to make sure this is clean after I'm done. But just work at it. Keep going. You can take your time. There's no need to rush like me. Especially if you want a, a, want a nice simple life. Do it right first time. Because imagine if you've got solder all over that PCB, It'll take you a lot longer to clean that up and make sure you've not shorted something than just taking that time initially. Right, well, I don't know what we think about this. It's, I think, it's not ideal, but we're at the point where we could start to check at least if there's any malleability on the board. You know, if you've, if you've done that, I'm just going to wiggle it a little bit, just check. Yeah, nope, it's still pretty convincingly adhering to that. I think we need to go around again. And to do that again, more flux, more sucking. So I shall show you another technique. So this is with solder braid. So make sure you have some of this solder braid, solder whip. And it can come pre-fluxed, like this one apparently is pre-fluxed, but I always like to add a little bit more. So I'm just going to reflux the board again. And if you want to, you can put a bit on your your braid and the cheap braid that you get on the uh, internet normally doesn't have too much flux on it so you want to do this again and just hold it against the component and you're with your solder iron really hot and you almost want to just you can move it slightly you can sort of rub it up and down just very slightly when I say slight I mean really slight you don't want to damage a pad and what happens is the heat from your soldering iron and the com combination of the heat from the soldering iron and the flux actually causes the solder on the board to wick through onto your solder wick. And that can help clear out that last little bit that can often linger. So give it a go. Like I said, these are very challenging variants of this board, so it does take effort. I suspect. If you're going to try this at home again just take your time and make sure you're prepared with the right materials in fact just if you've ordered a vamp take the time now to just open the lid and have a quick look just in case you want to get hold of anything else you might need if i had a, a dremel i certainly would attempt to see if there's a, a dremeling technique i'm pretty confident there would be where you would just try to remove the material of the can. I'll just show you here. You see, And you can see that now I've got the lid off, that you could get in there, cut those four connections with your Dremel, just cut them so now that board is, is separated. And then if you actually just cut here, 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 you can see the points even. If you cut those points here, this will extract and then you'll just be left with this metal bar here which you can probably leave in there, to be honest. You could probably just leave that piece in there. However, that will be a lot easier to desolder than trying to desolder this whole thing. So that's up to you. I think you'll probably be safer to do that, in all honesty. But I can see now, through my flexing of the board, it's almost there. There's not too much holding it. I'm just being very ginger just to see which pins are moving and which aren't. And I can see at the top, look, see right there at the top, those two have slipped through. And I'm just doing the same on the bottom. You can see the, the two main contacts are moving and it's just these last four. And those happen to be the last four that I haven't touched with the solder wick. So I'm just gonna go in there, wick those out.
sometimes when you're working on old electronics it's often easier to actually cut the old parts out like the old capacitors and things rather than try to desolder them and damage the board and then you just only have to desolder the final little legs in fact look at this now that's good good to go and you can see it's actually relatively cleanly come out there is still a lot of flux and things on there so it's a good time if you've got some isopropyl alcohol just to clean up your PCB before we start reassembling as you can see I've rushed ahead and installed the vamp board taking a bit of time to actually install the port cover while I was at it and what I've done instead of using the two front screw holes I've actually used diagonally I just think that's a little bit more stable on the board you will be short of two screws on this because there's four posts at Nintendo only use two screws so it's up to you if you've got a couple of compatible screws you can pop them in as well and now we're ready for soldering the mod. Now I will show you another th interesting thing on these and how the circuit works. So you actually have this power switch here. Remember I said you could jumper that across? And indeed you can. And what it does actually, part of this chassis is more or less live on a, on a Famicom and then it comes round to here, to these points right down here. You'll see here you've got basically two 5 volt rails and when you activate the switch it's it's, it's what powers up the board and it's actually a combination of powering this rail to this rail. <laughs> so depending on how you want to wire it to that switch, you have little options here, little fiddles. But I'm not going to do that today again. This is the simple approach. The second simple approach is to jump here and move this over to here. That will that'll be nice and simple. And then the uh, ultimate though simple approach is, if you don't mind, a little bit of quiescent current, which is fine. I'm used to that these days is to get a piece of wire. So I've just got a piece of a component lead here and I'm going to bend it into a U shape like that, like a staple. And then I'm going to cut it a little bit shorter using these side cutters because we're going to need too long, don't need it too long. And then what I'm going to do, I'll zoom in so you can see, we're going to pop it through that post. So I'm just going to use tweezers so my big fat fingers aren't in the way. And I'm just going to keep squeezing them gently till they're about the right pitch and with a bit of luck you get them in the hole like that and you can see it's just sitting in there and that's all you need and then get your soldering iron and just give it a little kiss one on each side so that's your first connection made which is great now we need to start linking between the main board and the power board and the first one to do is connect the ground. Now again, I would advise using insulated wire, just any wire really, just nice thin bits of wire. I'm just trying to find some line around here. Just the exact kind of wire that you've got everywhere that I seem to not have, or even a bit of this, look, the old ribbon cable, whatever you've got. But I'm gonna do an experiment today because I've never tried it. Um, and that's using, again, those same component leads because I've got quite a lot of these. <laughs> And I want to go from this ground point here, you see that nice little round ground point, to this ground bar here. That's going to connect the two grounds on the machine, basically. And I'm just going to just check the length. Now it is up to you. I've never actually tested this, and we're going to test it right now. But you can see here, we do have another ground connection here, but it does look to be isolated on this side of the board, but it's probably connected on the other side. But I've never actually checked that. It's not an issue, but let's check. They are connected. That's why it's not an issue. So don't worry about that. Um, in fact, I'm just going to cheat. I'm going to take this. I'm going to bend it over about three millimeters like that. You can see there's a little bend in it, a little dog leg. I'm going to post that dog leg through the hole from the top and I'm going to swivel it around, avoiding all of the other contact points because you really, you don't want it to touch the PCB if you can help it because it really shouldn't. You might end up shorting something. Again, use insulated materials if you're doing it. You can see that just like that. This is an experiment. We know when we power this one on, if it just goes up in smoke, it was probably not the best way to do this job. And you can see it's, t it's twisted, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna heat it and twist it at the same time. Come on, get to where I want you. That's it. And what you can do, in fact, I will, I will do this. this is <laughs> when I say what you can do, it's like what you absolutely should do. If you've got some, if you've got some heat shrink, if you're using this this technique that we just literally invented now, 
is you could just cut a little bit of heat shrink and you're basically making up your own wire, aren't you, at this point? Which is pretty cool. Oh, I'm just sliding that across. <laughs> Look, there you go. That's nice. If you make sure the heat shrink is plenty long enough, then it will be as insulated as you need it. Now I'm going to just solder that on. Again, it might take a little bit of heat because remember this was that big old contact. There you go, that's it. And if you've got a hot air blower, great. If you don't, maybe a lighter or something, you can... Oops, <laughs> that was a little bit too hot. Um, you, you can shrink it down, but don't apply so much heat. <laughs> now, you've got these four connections here and you'll see it says one, two, three, four, video, audio, five volts, five volts. So what we want to do is attach these two, we want to attach pins one and two, and then pins four. And again, I'm going to use that same technique. Just going to bend it over. I'm going to do a dog leg into the one. This is going to be fine. I like this. I'm, I might. This might be my way to to do this. This might be my go-to. And what I might do, I think, if you're going to do it, look, get that soldered in. Don't do anything else just yet. Keep going. I reckon keep going. Get them all in and ready. Like that. And then we're going to do the old heat shrink in one hit. Oh no! Okay, that's fine. We'll bend that one around. So I wonder if you've got anything in your kit that would do this job as well. You know, sometimes you get little jumper wires as part of a, if you buy an Arduino set or something. That might do. Or just a big old roll of old speaker cable. That can often be quite nice too. Th you know, not the, not the fat stuff, just the thin stuff. And then we're adding our 5 volts. So I think we're nearly there. So it's a little bit fiddly on this variant, but it's not that big a deal. If you're going through this much effort, I don't think this is going to phase you. So I'm going to cut some pieces of this. And I think this last one's the one where you want to be most cautious because that's your 5 volts, but really it's not touching anything. There's nothing it can actually short off looking at the PCB. I think you'll be okay. I mean, you'd have to be particularly bad luck if you do uh, bite something you shouldn't. That's it. So these bits of heat shrink don't really need to be very long at all. And it makes me wonder where people are adding their inductor, but this pin one is video. You might be able to just put an inductor between these two, two points, and those inductors just look like resistors. I'm not sure what you need. You could start with a, I don't know, 200 Henry inductor and see what that gives you, and then play with it. So anybody can comment down below if they have an idea of what style, size inductor. I think the style is gonna be definitely the ones that look like a resistor. that ready to solder and what I think I might do as an experiment I might just hit those with the hot air shrink them up first there because we didn't see we saw how that soldering um, we saw how that cigarette lighter didn't do a particularly good job of this so I'm just soldering them in now. That's the first one, that's the second, and that's the third. So those should be good to go. It's very exciting, I have to say. Now, double check your PCB. If you've got a little brush or something like that, go around and make sure you've brushed it, just to make sure there's no traces of any blobs of solder from all your desoldering. And that should be quite solderable. I'll pop the back on it. That's all back together, nice, uh, looks alright. And you can see from the back, it's a lovely nice finish. Um, I 
don't remember, does that chip out the corner when we started? Yeah, I mean, this is the sort of thing you expect to find on these old units, but it's up to you. We're going to be getting those clear top shells at some point, so you've always got an option on the top shell, or if you want to, and I've seen it done really well, just get your various types of plastic resins and things, and you can actually just fill that in, Dremel out that part there and just paint it all up nice to match. I mean, you can fix these as much. It depends what you want to do with it. If you just want to play it or you want to look at it. For me, it's about the playing. And if you're buying these scrappers, you don't have to worry about it, isn't it? You just get them going and enjoy these things. Right, let's check the cartridge slot works fine. Yes, it does. And we're going to be trying this one with whatever this is. It's a Bandai thing. Time to fire up the monitor. But before we do, just to show you the last thing we need, and that's the lead that comes with the vamp. Lovely gold connectors. And just plug that in the back. Literally, you're good to go. Obviously, you need your power. There we go, Pocket Zorus is loading up. I don't know what Pocket Zorus is, but that's apparently what this is. So I'm gonna start the game. And I think we lucked out with this one because the controller seems to be working and it's moving around. That's exactly all of the things we wanna be able to do. However, it would be churlish of me to say everything is good and dandy because <laughs> you can see the system next to it is in pieces. I had everything set up on the desk nicely to demonstrate to you. However, this one didn't work. So I did check. It was drawing the correct amount of power on the bench power supply. The oscilloscope was saying the oscilloscope was saying that it was running at the correct frequency on the crystal. So it is running. The PPU and GPU are not getting hot, but it does, didn't work. And that's, of course, the danger you will also have if you buy something from eBay that says not working. Of course, installing a power vamp into something that's not working before the mod will definitely not work after the mod. So you've got to be careful on that one. So I'm going to have to investigate this one further. Normally they are quite repairable, so I'm not too worried about that, but we do have a nice looking system on this one. Maybe I'll swap the eject button from this one to that one so this one is done, put it on the shelf, and then I shall explore this and you've got, there's not too much on here, right? It, in my experience, I normally lift the GPU and PPU and we can swap those out. That probably will do it. Fingers crossed. And will you look at it? We are actually running with our existing unit. Just turn it off so it's a bit quieter. But hopefully you can see that what we've done here is actually change out the PPU and uh, CPU with clone ones. Now there is a, an added advantage with that. There's a disadvantage and an advantage and I'll tell you what you get. In fact, let me just pop this. Oh, there we go. Let's get a better view. So when you swap the chips like this, you do have a little bit of incompatibility. So what happens is when you put the clone chips in, because they, they don't introduce as much noise as the Rico, you get an actual cleaner picture, which is a plus. However, they don't work with the Famicom disk drive. So that's why I wrote a little note here. And I'll write a little note on this in case I sell this or give it away. So people know if they're trying to run it with a disk drive, um, there could be an issue. Now, generally I'm finding in practice, disk drive usage is definitely on its way out even with the disk drive emulators I don't use it really anymore it's just a hassle because one you can pick up cartridges dirt cheap anyway actual cartridges but two the multi carts are so pervasive you can just go online and just find those 2001 multi carts and slam them in it really makes the disk drive kind of pointless unless you really die hard want to play those games that can use the save facility like maybe Legend of Zelda 2 or <laughs> something like that but that's great. I'm going to package that all up. Mmm, dirty grill, but even more mmm, RGB goodness. <laughs> I absolutely adore the way it shines through this grill. It is, it's quite special. I know it doesn't seem like much in this picture. It does, the, the visuals through the camera do not do it justice, but Overall, there you go. I am very pleased with this. I feel that there's still work to do to restore them, of course. This right-hand control, I would say, <laughs> I definitely would modify it. And if it's something that you're not really going to use, because if you're not going to do the Poles voice in Zelda, <laughs> you can probably disconnect that. We could probably figure out, or maybe just a little bit of uh, contact cleaner. In fact, why don't we do that now? Squizzed into there might be all it needs just to sort of clean up that old variable resistor that's in there. 
perhaps that's all it preview i fixed it but i say these are in condition ready to be restored i might 3d print one of these i'm going to model this and 3d print it look at look out for all my thingy verse because that could be a nice thing to change these are really brutally fragile by the way when you try to get these out these tangs snap off so this looks like a part that we should really <laughs> remanufacture so that we can reuse them and I'll probably just chuck these up on uh, the website, really, if anybody wants to, to have a unit that is, I guess, ready to restore, I'd call them. We know that they work. The CPU, GPUs are all fine. You've got the power vamp on. They're giving it quality power and video output, and it's working with the cartridges. So within, within those caveats of this being a clone chipset, I don't think there's uh, really any issues. So hopefully that's been of some interest to you. I might get more of these. I'm curious to see under the hood. Uh, we've we've certainly stacking up a little pile of all of these guys now. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I sometimes feel bad. You go, well, this is a bit of original tech. You know, do we feel bad taking these out? But then, yeah, not so bad, really. I think being able to use your system is is probably... Um, a better. So let me know down below and your views on that and anything and of course you can join us on Discord or go to thebackofficeshow.com to pick up your own power vamp. As ever, thank you so much for watching. So you can see here on the screen some footage. I'm just recording a bit of footage from each unit. The first bit of footage that you're seeing now is on the yellowed unit that had the clone chipset and what we're seeing is the Super Mario Brothers 3 introduction sequence. Pay attention to the various areas on the screen like the dark areas and the light areas and how they interact because this is where you might start to see your jail bars if you've got a particularly sensitive system. But I think you'll find with the vamp installed like now it's pretty rock solid. I am using a bench power supply but any good quality power supply will give you that. And you can see that you've got a nice consistent uh, coloring on the single color areas. Again, this is normally where you'd start to see them, those very heavy uh, gel bars and possibly that weird shimmering, pixel creep type shimmering. But you can see on that, rock solid. So very pleased with the clone chipset. So I'm now going to actually swap the wires on the back. And yeah, I am actually here. So you will see that happening. So I'm gonna turn off the unit on the left. Now we do have the paler unit, one of the original Nintendo chips on the right. Now I do hear that there are some issues with the clones. You've got to be careful, as I said, with the clones, they don't always work with the disk drives. So now I do have the cartridge in the right-hand side unit. Let's turn it on. Oh, <laughs> let me give it a little bit of a, <laughs> I'm gonna blow. We always know that blowing helps. But when you see things like that corruption, that just means that you do have um, an issue with the actual cartridge. And actually, I think this one has an issue with the microphone. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the volume down a bit so we don't get that feedback. But yeah, that, so if you do have an issue with noise, that's what's going on here. And there's a variable resistor in this control that's clearly not working as it should. Oops, slam that down a bit hard. Let's hit reset. Oh dear, these old cartridge ports look like they could do with a clean. Let's turn that on again. So you can see here now, again, very good picture. And there's a very slight hint. You've got these little hints in the background. It's a really linear pattern, but again, very smooth, very nice looking actually. Very good, good output actually on this. I'm very pleased. Pleased on both of these. So yeah, I think you could play that all day long. Um, not noticing any interactions between here. Again, it's only in the, the black area. I don't know, I, I feel I could see something, but now that I'm looking, I'm not sure I am. It's again, one of those things that plays tricks on you. When you've seen these in the original uh, RF and original composite output, the picture is so bad. Um, you, it's like night and day. We're trying to compare things in our mind to HDMI when we're looking at that, but that is a great picture. So all in all, um, yeah, very pleased.
I couldn't leave you knowing that you would be curious as to how a 3D printed button would come out. And there you go, you can see it's not really perfect in terms of the colour, it's not far off, but finding a filament that would be the exact match would be very difficult. But there's absolutely nothing stopping you painting this, you could easily just give it a blast with an airbrush. But I think I prefer having a slightly off-coloured, non-broken one than a uh, broken, actual coloured one. So I'm going to see if I can slot this in, so that's how it's going to fit. And the danger is of course these little tabs and 3D print might not be as, quite as flexible flexible as an actual original plastic when it was fresh but let's see oh it's almost going in I just need to modify this a little bit just to make sure it can run in the groove whittling away at the plastic there's a lot of manual effort post-processing required on some 3D prints, I have to tell you. But it's worth it in the end, usually. So that marries up now, that groove that you see there. Just need to clear it out. But did I clear out enough? Ooh, close. Oh, there it is, it's in. Yeah! That is pretty good. I'm trying to remember if it does retract. I'm not sure if it actually did retract even with the other one. Yeah, it's a pretty weak spring. Yeah, not bad at all. There you go. 